This is the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. Welcome, welcome, welcome to another fresh edition of Tiger Stock with Chirco and Company. I'm your host, Vito Geronimo, Jerome Chirco, and my sidekick and partner in crime is alongside with me as usual across from me at this very table in the Sterling Heights Detroit Sports Podcast Network studios, and that is the doc, John Macaroon. John, how's it going? Another week, Vito. I'm looking forward to chatting baseball. I know Brad Osmus came out and finally expresses some frustration, and I'm looking forward to getting your opinion on what happened this week in spring training, talking about Brad Osmus' frustration. I know you got some prospects you're looking at, but I guess to start off, we have to welcome our guest in studio. Always great to have Dom here in the Sterling Heights studio, man. Welcome. Well, uh, thank you for having me on the show, guys. Uh, Talking about spring training baseball, the World Baseball Classic as well, Tigers representing there, and, um, and their spring training woes, too, we'll touch base on. And you know what, John Paul, J.P. Morosi of Fox Sports, foxsports.com, Emily Network. He is the World Baseball Classic expert aficionado for those two entities. Dominic Turco is the resident World Baseball Classic expert for the Detroit Sports Podcast Network, specifically about Team USA and the pool that they're playing in to start off in the WBC, which is Pool C. And they're playing at Marlins Park in Miami, along with Team Canada, uh, Team Colombia, and the Dominican Republic Republic team. So you got Dominican Republic as a strong squad, as usual. Team Canada not featuring much. Team Colombia has a White Sox pitcher in Jose Quintana uh, and Julio Tehran, another good starting. So they got some guys that, you know, Dom can talk about even more than I can, but some very big notables from Team USA and also from Team Dominican Republic. The Dominican Republic team is the best one, I would say, but Team USA has to be right behind, maybe a hair or two behind this year. And I would say the pitching, Dominic, is the weakest area of Team USA. Wouldn't you yeah, say I so would, when I looking would, at Team USA's would, roster? If you're looking at the roster, yeah, especially, I mean, I, I'm pretty cool with the bullpen. You've got uh, Michael Givens, Luke Gregerson, Nate Jones, Jake McGee, Andrew Miller, Pat Neshek, um, and uh, David Robertson. But the starters, you're going to see where how deep can some of these starters go especially because with pitch count in the first round um, of the tournament is only if if you have, you throw 50 pitches, then you're done for four games. Um, And then if you throw 30 pitches, you have one day rest. So um, it's easy. It's going to be tough to, you're going to have to extend some guys. Like you might have to extend like a Michael Givens, give him maybe a long relievers role. Uh, But the, uh, the starters with Archer, uh, Duffy, Stroman and Roark, uh, it's it could be better. Um, could be better, and Doc has something to say, and always very insightful. Let's see what he has to say here, Doc. No, no, I'm just curious, Dom. You know, tell me a little bit before you guys get into the nuts and bolts, and I'm very curious to listen because I'm not really a guy that's into the World Baseball Classic. I'd rather have the guys that we're paying big money to because you know Michael Fulmer hurt his ankle before. I, I don't not sure. I think he hurt his ankle for the Tigers, but he's not pitching in the World Baseball Classic. But then it makes you think. You know, had Fulmer gone over there and pitched, you know, in the World Baseball Classic, not with the Tigers, and he got hurt, then you go, really? It's a situation where, you know, fans are paying big money for these guys to perform for the Tigers. And I'm just curious what Dom thinks. Do you see any value? And tell me, what is the value of the World Baseball Classic? And it's just, to me, I'm not really interested in it. I just don't want any of my guys, any of the, the Tigers, to go down there, perform, be part of the Classic, and then have an injury, and and to have it affect the Tigers in any way negatively. What's the positives of this thing? Well, really quick, Dom, before you get to that, Michael Fulmer specifically, he sprained his ankle. It's a grade one sprain, and he did it this past Saturday in agility drills, of all things. So, Osmus characterized it as a grade one sprain, which means it's of the lowest severity. Dom, what is now the World Baseball well, Classic? What does it bring the most, you think? Well, I think for, and Joe McGrain mentioned this before, he said it was tougher it was on the MLB Network broadcast, it was tougher for the pitchers that are vying for a spot on a roster. It was tougher for them because um, they, they're they rolling out, you know, usually during spring training, this will just, this it's just like an extended spring training for guys that would, because it's in the middle of March, 
Um, they've already had some games under their belt. And when you're playing in Lakeland, so my, if, if Michael Fulmer was healthy, you're playing in Lakeland, Michael Fulmer would get more innings later in spring training. So by pitching for T- Team USA, he would get more, he would get the same amount of work with the USA team as he would with the Tigers team in spring training. And, and the managers, you'll see, I, I would, Leland's probably going to be, you might not see as many breaking pitches for the first you know, round. The World Baseball Classic is just a, an extension of spring training for most pitchers. Joe McGrain even backed this up. He said it's tougher for um, the guy vying for the spot because they really, they've, been, they've been rusty. They've been working hard the all off season. There, there's no guaranteed spot, so um, there's a more pressure on them. Where here, I mean, there is pressure because you're pitching for your country, but it's a little different in the fact that it is basically an extension of the work and then, Dom, really quick, you're not going to get as much work, perhaps, pitching for a nation in this World Baseball Classic. It's not like these managers have to pitch you, where in spring training, if you're going to be on the roster come opening day, they're going to pitch you and give you your innings. Like, Fulmer might not even have pitched anyways in, for Team USA in the World Baseball Classic, outside of a few outside of a few innings, obviously. But I was going to say, kind of sarcastically... And with the rest, too. You have, you have the, with the pitch count. You throw 50 pitches, you, you're, you have to rest for four days, so... Let's say someone, let's say Archer, for some reason, threw 50 pitches. The first pool in the pool A, once they get past pool A, the, those games in pool A, he pitches the first game, he's not pitching the rest of the way for that pool. He has yeah, to wait yeah. till the second round yep. with four days rest. And there is that designated pool of pitchers as well that teams can pick from going into each round as they yes, advance. So yes, that's also key add, to bring up. Yep. Yeah. Where Fulmer, I believe, was not going to be, obviously, anyways, a part of pool C. So he wouldn't have pitched anyways. It was more about the future. Danny Duffy is one of those guys from the designated pool of pitchers who is active for this round of games. So Duffy, you know, will get in. And the thing is, though, backing up your point kind of, too, is that they have this deep pool of pitchers to pick from because of those inning restrictions. And then to keep these guys healthy and fresh for the start of the regular season for their major league club. So it makes sense why they're you know, having these pitchers be used in this manner via this designated pool of pitchers that they can pick from each round as they advance. And Team USA might not even get out of pool C. It's that hard in this round getting out of its own pool. So we might not see them pass this. Now, the thing is, I think the Dominican Republic, we can all agree upon, is the, the best team of their pool. But going back now a little bit here, you mentioned Jim Leland, didn't you? He is yeah. a skipper. We got to give some love whenever we can give some love to Jim Leland. And I think a pat on the behind from Jim Leland equates to something a little bit of a higher magnitude than Brad Osmus giving Michael Fulmer a pat on the behind. So there is that a little bit too. But it sounds like Fulmer is very doubtful at this point for pitching in the WBC for Team USA. I got a funny story about Jim Leland. So I was listening to the spring training games because watching it on TV is a little bit tough right now. So I'm a guy that likes to just sit, have a cocktail, you know, sit in the garage. And they were um, playing a team, I I can't remember off the top of my head, but the Tigers were playing, and it was the the last game that Anibal Sanchez pitched. And he wasn't pitching well, and Jim Leland is sitting in behind the radio guys, and they're yucking it up. They're having a good old time. I think it was last weekend, I believe on Saturday. So they are yucking it up, and they're talking about, you know, Jim Price and Dan Dickerson are talking about getting Anibal Sanchez right. And they go, well, we got Jim Leland back here. Jim, you know, how do we get Anibal Sanchez right? And he sits back and he goes, listen, I'm retired. you got to figure that out. So they were joking around. <laughs> it's not around. his problem anymore. He's yep. like, not my problem yep. anymore. And it just goes to show you that it's kind of funny and stressful. They are trying to keep it light. And it was very interesting to see them laughing, laughing it up. And Jim Leland's a funny dude off the, you know, once he retired, he's very jovial and much more, you know, approachable than when he was the mm-hmm. manager because everyone kind of knew him as, hey, if they would question his lineup, if they started questioning him at all as a manager, he's a little bit crotchety, but it was nice to see him, you know, in spring training kind of keeping it loose. And the announcers, because they were talking about, you know, Hannibal Sanchez's terrible numbers in spring training and they were yucking it up. So it's quite funny. And Jim Price loves to yuck it up as well about pitchers yeah. such as Anibal Sanchez and give them excuses, all the excuses in the book to make it sound like they have a chance to, you know, have a reclamation story when it's not really the case with Anibal I think at this point or Mike Palfrey both guys are probably long lost you know with the Tigers they're not even good enough to get a bullpen spot and kind of now going into that a little bit with Mike Palfrey specifically and what we saw from him and his start Monday in the place of Michael Fulmer and he was horrible his spring training ERA is miserable at 12 he's 0-3 in spring and three games and two games started specifically. And Pelfrey, he was going smoothly. Through the first two innings, he cruised through the first two on Monday against the Baltimore Orioles. Then in the third inning, he allowed 
allowed hits to five of the six Baltimore batters that he faced. And he allowed five runs that were all earned in two and a third innings in his outing. A miserable one for himself. And now, as I said, in three games, his ERA is a 12. This guy is not cutting the mustard seed whatsoever and might lose a roster spot completely. Dom, are we at that point where he should lose a roster spot completely after seeing his ineffectiveness time in and you know time in and time out throughout spring so far? They might have to go forth and eat his contract. He's been this bad. I mean, even in spring training, if you're not giving, I mean, he's walking guys hit after hit. It, it looks like he's not throwing downhill. It looks like his arm is you know getting ahead of him. Uh, before he delivers the ball, the balls are up. I think right now the Tigers really have to make that that choice as soon as possible because you have two pitchers, not just him, but you have Anibal Sanchez who is not in good not in good standing with uh, even you know the Tigers right now, the, the Osmus. And I don't know if you can. I think you can fix Pelfrey because I mean I'm not saying you can do a lot, but you can fix him maybe to get his get his motion down and make sure he's ste- he's got to keep that arm. Move, throw downhill, um, and get and, and do some ground balls. Where uh, Sanchez, I think that's a lost cause. So you think he is more than Mike Pelfrey at this point? I know he's that home run guy, Annabelle Sanchez. Big numbers in the past that he's given up yeah, to he, opponents. He, he, uh, Pelfrey can get outs without working as hard. Uh-huh. You'll see he won't. He can get that one pitch out. He can get that two one two pitch. Sanchez is he is he's a he used to be the workhorse that he was. Now, remember, he led the American League in ERA, but walks are up with him comparative to, compared to Pelfrey and pitches. He'll throw more pitches than Pelfrey. In that respect, he is, although right now they're both throwing meatballs, so I can't, it's, it's hard to decipher who's better off, but I would say Pelfrey uh, is, better, is better right now. Than- and think about it, Anibal Sanchez got bounced against the Braves without their greatest hitters in their lineup, and guys that aren't even great that will be making their major league roster come opening day and be in their starting lineup come opening day. And then Pelfrey against, you would have to believe, not the best of the Orioles, too, in their everyday lineup, or the everyday lineup that will be featured in the regular season. So these guys aren't facing major league caliber lineups uh, one through nine right now, and they're getting bounced around. And I guess, in defense of Pelfrey, at least he was smoothly going through the batting order of the Orioles through the first he two was, innings, the but first, then he gets bounced around. Like two innings, he can go two, two or smooth. three, and Sanchez, yeah. same thing, go two or three innings, yeah. and then they're done, and they're totally ineffective. So maybe they're bullpen guys, long relievers, but that's the best-case scenario. And you want two long relievers that are making as much money as they are in your major league bullpen come opening day when you can use somebody on the cheap in that role instead? doesn't make much sense, right? Because at this point, even if you think Palfrey is more fixable, if you had to say who's fixable out of the two, and you're saying he's more than Annabelle still. Still, yeah, yeah. Do you really want him being used in a long relief role? For all the money that he's making, it's not totally worth it to use that guy in that long relief role. Absolutely you know? not. And this, is, this, this goes back to the Tigers really being indecisive right when the offseason started. They dumped Maven's contract. They, they dumped Maven right away. Um, and then they, were, they, didn't know what they, they didn't know what they wanted to do. We heard there, there could have been pressure from the players in the roster and they could have added a reliever uh, like Brad Ziegler during the offseason to really solidify, give them a middle reliever, long reliever, do whatever you want, and then one of them would be completely expendable, wouldn't, even, wouldn't have been, even if had been invited uh, to, the spring, to spring training at And all. now they have the lack of depth in their pen. You know, their pen's kind of stinky as it is, so who are you going to really choose to put in there, you know? You're forced to, though, it's, it seems like, maybe to put in one of the two in your pen in a long relief role, it looks like, because of the fact they're making so much money, and your your pen is lacking in depth. So that might benefit at least one of the two, but I think you can't carry both come opening day, and we've talked about that ad nauseum. Wanted to revert back to the World Baseball Classic discussion a little bit here, and focusing on Team USA and how deep, really, the lineup especially is. All their great hitters, Paul Goldschmidt, uh, Nolan Arenado, uh, you got some... Quality major league hitters, Eric Cosmer, Adam Jones, uh, Giancarlo Stanton. You have Christian Yelich, uh, Ian Kinsler, who we all know about. So this is a deep lineup. Is it capable of, well, winning it all? I mean, because you're going to have to beat some good foes, such as the Dominican Republic in this pool. Um, They look like a favorite. Is Team USA at that level, the same level as the Dominican Republic and some of the other upper echelon ball clubs in this year's World Baseball Classic Dom? I think uh, lineup wise, they're right up there. But uh, you know, it it all comes down to you know, pitchers. Who has the best pitching in these 
tournaments. And we've seen Japan, who we had last in two years, the, not this last World Baseball Classic, but the World Baseball Classic before in 2009, uh, when they won at Dodger Stadium, they had, I mean, they brought in for the save, uh, you Darvish, if you remember that. So you need pitching and the Really, the starters that the the United States is going to bring out there every game. Who's it, the sexiest guy, Chris Archer? It's probably Archer. Yeah, it, it is. It is Archer, but there's much to be uh, asked of, asked of, a, guy of, like of a guy like and that, and it might not be believable because hmm. there's some doubt carrying uh, Archer as your ace. You know, hanging over the shoulders of Archer because is he a true ace of a team that has to face all these upper echelon hitters as you go from round to round? If they even get out of their own pool, which will be tough in itself. But I think, Dom, what I nailed down and what you're saying, what you, I guess you're agreeing with me here they're, about they're, the pitchers, I think we're right in saying that's the weakness here. And it's a, quest, it's a question mark if they have, well, enough ace caliber arms, really, right, to throw out there, too, to start these games. Yeah, I, I, listen, a lot of these teams really don't have aces. I mean, uh-huh. the Netherlands had Vandenberg pitching, who's been a, he bounced around in AAA. He was pitching in uh uh, Japanese league last year for the Netherlands. He was their ace. So there's not a lot of really true aces out there, even for Japanese the Japanese team. Both of those teams, can Cuba and Japan, combined for 17 runs today. Um, there's a lot of offense there. So it should be exciting so for people to exciting. watch that aren't the traditional baseball fans, too, and that are getting used to baseball on the international and stage, there's, not just the national and there's stage a, right now. You have Cespedes' half-brother, too. Who's playing for you? You had brought him up. He's younger than you and I combined, and you're he's, a young individual. You're not even 21. Can't even he, drink legally he's yet. He's 19. Now, yep. I don't know if you have drank before. Maybe I do know the answer to that, but we're going to say no right now, yep. as I didn't drink before 21 either. And I know Doc surely didn't either, because he's a stand up man. Okay, yep. all the time. Not a sip. Not a yep. sip of alcohol, of anything. Now, I know, well, there are a few guys that will be able to drink on all these rosters. Now, the first game of Class C, by the way, is Canada versus the Dominican Republic on Thursday at 6 p.m. And then you have in Game 2, Colombia versus the U.S., Friday at 6. So the U.S. faces Colombia to start off. And Colombia, I think I already mentioned it earlier in the podcast, now features Jose Quintana of the White Sox and Julio Turan of the Braves. Two good frontline starting arms. But then they don't have the hitters. It's funny because a lot of these teams, Dom, it seems like in Doc, are stacked with the hitters. But they don't have as fearful of pitching or intimidating of pitching that can really carry you throughout this tournament as it looks right now. But still, it's good when you're scoring runs. It's exciting to watch, and I think that might intrigue more people than you seeing a one to nothing game or 2-1 to one game. And I think for you as well, Doc, right? No, no, no doubt about it. But did you also hear the news regarding Cuba and Jose Iglesias earlier in the day on Tuesday? It's just kind of one of those things where it is unfortunate. You realize that some of the players that are playing in Major League Baseball were Cuban defectors, and they're not now, even though it kind of sounds like an oxymoron, even though the United States relationship with Cuba has gotten significantly better over the course of Obama's term in the presidency, but Cuba is banning some Major League Baseball players that did defect. And, you know, it makes you really think, and you go, some players just die for their country. And a guy like Jose Iglesias is banned from playing on the Cuban team. And it's just unfortunate to realize that you think about it and still, even in a World Baseball Classic, there's still some political ramifications. And it's unfortunate because you'd like and you'd hope that everybody that wants to play for their country and represent is able to. But Jose Iglesias isn't. And uh, for those that don't know, can you shed light a little bit on it? You know, Cuba as a country is definitely sensitive and you have to be careful that, you know, when Cuba shows up to this tournament, that some of the players that are on there now... Stick with them because, as everyone knows, Cubans like to defect. And it's, it's, it's unfortunate that that's kind of where the road takes some of the Cubans. Yeah, and those Cuban defectors defecting to the U.S. aren't viewed in the most positive light. We know the story about Jose Fernandez, too, obviously, and what he had to endure through. He had tried to get over how many times? Like four times? Something like that numerous well, Jose times. Jose did have. He had, did he, too, yeah. as a Cuban defector? You see all these guys great talent to leave his son his and it's sad what they have to leave behind their families and their families those members get over because you know they're coming over maybe they don't even have it easier on a boat too but it's it's tough they could lose their lives and that's just not cool and they got to deal with it it's too bad unfortunate uh but it's great when they come over here and they can live out their lives in a well with freedom and then really they're taking part in what their passion is, playing baseball. So, and they can, I guess, live it up a little bit more. You know, have, well, they have more freedom. So, but um, and the last, Team Cuba is always talented, the by the way, world, too. And they're talented. World Baseball There's, Classic, they have, yeah. They have some talent. Their lineup's usually always pretty good. Last World Baseball Classic, Abreu and Yasmani Tomas burst onto the scene in Cuba. And this year, too, you've got a guy that's never really made it, uh, Frederick Cepeda, who's always been on the Cuban national team. He's, Cepeda, he, any relation to... Uh, 
Orlando, Orlando Cepeda. I wonder. But like you know what the thing is too with this, if you're really a, a baseball nut, the beauty of this tournament is that you can find talent, right? Find those diamonds in the rough and guys that well just emerge out of the scene and become big time studs at the major league level. So yeah, and there's there's always guys that always you know guys, you'll there's find. guys that aren't even there's guys that are career you know Japanese league players and playing for Japan Matsuda in that Nippon League maybe the, Nippon League, the yeah. guys that can smash home runs 30, 40 bombs and maybe they come over here and they can be valuable members of a major league ball club and too. So there's always guys they were saying to look out for the guy as well. the best the scouts have already said that Matsuda, Matsuda uh, who was four for five today he's the best international prospect out there. Uh, in that pool, so I mean, Japan, Cuba, China, and Australia are in that pool. So even when there's not major league players, there's still talent, and scouts are still out there searching for the guys. So it is very good to see. And Doc had brought up having passion for your country, plan for your country, and there is passion involved with that. I think having pride for your country, and well, a guy that definitely has had that is well, and not only for your country, but just for something that you have a, a, a tie to, and Brett Osmus was a manager of Team Israel. He had some passion for that, obviously, before he became the skipper of the Tigers, but he's no longer the manager of Team Israel. And guess what's happened to Team Israel, Doc? They're 2-0 and in the World Baseball Classic. So the big, the thing I'm trying to get at is that if you don't have Osmus, you win more games. The Tigers probably should take note. Now, their manager is Jerry Weinstein, who is a manager of the Double A affiliate of the Colorado Rockies, who had a productive campaign in 2016 as their skipper, winning like 74 games. I guess Osmus has done that now, winning 86 last year. But it's kind of a joke here, but also a little bit of truth about my ridicule for Brad Osmus and why he shouldn't be the skipper. Now, Vito, Doc. what a perfect segue in that tweet after tweet, as I'm reading here, as you guys are talking about the World Baseball Classic, very good stuff from you guys. But oh, again, thank you. Yes. But again, sorry not to include you a little bit more, but go on. No problem. I'm definitely in that conversation <laughs> looking to learn. Uh huh. But I want to get both of your sense of how important is spring training because people are looking and again, tweet after tweet. The Tigers are not only losing games in the Grapefruit League, they're getting crushed. And a tweet now from Anthony Fennick just came across the wire, and it said that of all the 12 Grapefruit League games, this game versus the Phillies that the Tigers played on Tuesday was absolutely awful, and it was the worst. And game after game, the Tigers are losing, but you know that some of the rosters depleted. They're not there. They're injured. They're going to the World Baseball Classic. So how much stock, and what do you guys look for in spring training? Because it seems like more and more with a bad team— there's more focus on the team, like how they're playing, what's going on. But versus the good teams, I have no idea what the Cubs are doing. I have no idea what the Indians are doing in spring training. I kind of look at it as kind of around maybe March 20th, you start to hone in on what the team is doing. But what should we be looking at as fans, and what should I be looking at in terms of spring training, especially now that I keep hearing the Tigers are getting shelled game in, game out in this Grapefruit League? Well, you got to, I think, just look for guys to get the reps in. I think as well, and then to show signs of improvement or getting better as spring training progresses. And then, you know, the big controversy with this World Baseball Classic, second back into that discussion too, is that it takes these guys off their games and they're not getting as many reps than by participating in the World Baseball Classic. And maybe that's why we've seen some guys not show their pride for their country that might be passionate guys about the U.S., such as Clayton Kershaw, such as Mike Trout, such as Bryce Harper. And the Tigers have been slammed a lot. You're right. And now I'm totally going in another direction back to what you were saying. The, the point is, is that you can't get too much from it, though, from those results, from those big blowouts that they're suffering. You know, you really can't take right. too much and in the, that way. You just got to see that they're showing signs of improvement or guys are simply getting their reps and in, right, down. If we're talking about record, the Angels, would be, that means the Angels who were undefeated prior to yesterday, that means they would be the best team in baseball since they're undefeated. A lot of it has to do with, you know, who's getting the reps and are they executing the reps? So a lot of if you're you know if you're a guy like uh, NL MVP Chris Bryant and you're you're struggling you're striking out all the time and your team's doing bad well then I think that could go into the beginning of the season where you might struggle a little bit and then that and added to that uh, in addition the Tigers if Verlander's struggling if Verlander's you know giving maybe his two innings and he's he's walking guys he's giving up hits giving up runs. Then going into the season, you have Verlander, you know, starting off. He might come off a little bit, you know, rusty on on the onset of the start of the onset mm. of the season. So in that respect, I think if you got your you know your core guys hitting, and a lot of it, a lot of it has to do with you know, a lot of you know hitting coaches like to see the guys go deep at least once. I know Todd Steverson made this point, a hitting coach in the past, because he he likes to see guys that are able to you know to handle some fastballs. And they might what they might do to get them going again is you know keep them out there 
extend it like later in the spring training, keep him out there. They might have him pitch against a if he struck a lesser team, a right? lesser team. Yeah, put him like in a split squad. Put him against you know a lesser pitcher and get see if he can get going that way. Even in minor league Even camp, in minor right? League camp. Yep. So a lot of it has to do with players and not the team. Um, and that's that's a very good point. I think that's really what I was trying to say. And what people should really realize, Doc, is that it's not as important about the team's results at but, all. And that's why it's important about individuals. So like a guy like Pelfrey right now, that's not good. Or a guy like Sanchez, that's not good. Absolutely. It's about individual performances. And we want to talk about a few individuals and whether or not it's wrong for them not to be playing for Team USA and whether or not we should be upset about that. We'll talk about that after this commercial break, though, on Tiger's Talk with Chirko and Company. Doc here for the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. Thank you for your continued support and allowing us to keep the studio lights on, the microphones hot here at the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. If you like what you're listening to, you like the variety of podcasts that you hear, definitely check out our website, DetroitSportsPodcast.com. That's the easiest way to support us. You get all the news from the network. You can check out the work from Vito, myself, all the guys that are putting out great content almost each and every day. And hey, if you're prone to shop online, click through that Amazon banner, go about your business, shop, and then when you're on that Amazon page, just bookmark it. Anytime at all that you make an online purchase, it kicks us back a little something and helps us keep this project going. We've been going strong since 2013, and that's been largely due to the support of our supporters, and we greatly appreciate it. DetroitSportsPodcast.com <laughs> And back here on episode number 81 of Tiger's Talk with Chirko and Company. My brother is with me for this fresh edition of the podcast as I now uh, kind of rest after running a 40-yard dash. I ran a 4-3-5. Yes, I did. I am as fast as many NFL players out there who have been running uh, at the scouting combine. Now, Vito, not too many people take money off the dock. Congratulations. Check out the video on our Twitter page at Detroit Podcast. And thanks to everybody that's been downloading this fine podcast each and every Wednesday, Vito has the best guests, does a great job, very well produced, I must say. Thank you, Doc. I appreciate that compliment. And, Dom, I could use some more compliments out of you. Uh, maybe about my time, how great was it was. the fastest I've ever seen you run. I've never run faster. And, honestly, I didn't realize with these short legs, I could have as long of strides as Mike Trout or Bryce Harper. And we got to talk about those guys right now, about how they're not participating and the World Baseball Classic for Team USA. Clayton Kershaw, same thing. These stud players who are really faced as a Major League Baseball, and they're not willing to participate. Uh, should we be upset, Dominic, about that? I think a lot of uh, Kershaw last year, he, he was bouncing back from the injury, and he wanted to you know get acclimated with the Dodgers going into this offseason. You know, I'll give Kershaw a little bit of leeway there, but you know Bryce Harper... A lot of this has to do with, you know, where they are in their contract. Bryce Harper's another one. You know, he's going to be a free agent. So a lot of this has to do with maybe Bryce didn't want to risk getting injured during the World Baseball Classic. And then during his, you know, free agent season, he's not going to be uh, 100%. And that's going to ruin his, you know, his earnings for the upcoming years. Trout's another one, too. Uh, young up and coming star. He's the best player in Major League Baseball. A lot of this has to do with maybe, his, I don't know a lot about Trout's reasoning. Maybe, you know, it's marketing that maybe not good enough. Because really, he's, really, it's hard to find the reason for him because really he's right. been healthy throughout his career. I know Harper hasn't all the time and Kershaw hasn't. So you can kind of pinpoint that as a reason for those two guys for not participating in this year's World Baseball Classic for Team USA. And now the question is, will they ever participate for Team USA? Or is this kind of like LeBron James not participating in the slam dunk contest in the NBA? Is it something like that? I, Where, you know, it's just not going to happen, actually. As much as we want to talk about it, it's just not going to happen. I think now, I think these guys are their, now Archer's playing now, but I think, you know, Trout and Harper, I'd give them a couple years, um, and then we can judge based on you know, when, where they are when they're 27, 28. If they're not playing for Team USA by then, I mean, Trout will probably still be one of the best players in Major League Baseball, and I'm assuming Harper is too. If I think Kershaw's only 26, too. Yeah. We'll see. I mean, he has a mileage on his arm. He mile- might not make it. He might not make it right to the next World Baseball Classic and be in his prime. I mean, he probably will be around in less than an injury, major arm injury. So, and he's gone through stuff though already, like you noted too, Dom. And it's good to yeah. Last year he was hurt. Yep. Um, he came back last year and he still posted 
great numbers. Maybe, you know, he his reasoning is he's looking at it and say, well, I want to get acclimated with the Dodgers in camp early. Um, I don't want to risk anything. I don't want to throw too much. And you've seen in their outings against the White Sox, he was really sharp his first outing uh, of the season of spring training. But it also is nice to see young guys, young young rising stars like J- John Carlos Stanton and Nolan Arenado playing too. Though. Arenado's a stud who needs a lot more attention. So right. I guess by Trout Harper, that's why I said marketing. Right? Those guys need marketing, more attention. It's not. I mean, there's not that much to you know market for Trout. And Mark, Mike Trout is already the best player. He doesn't need that you know foot in the, in the, on the field um, to make his mark in the, in the, for everyone else to see. I mean, he, everyone else knows now. Basically, when you say, well, who's the best player in Major League Baseball? Well, you think Mike Trout. Nolan Arenado, on the other hand. People still don't know people him. People don't know him, yeah. And he's so. a stud. And is it because he plays you know, in Colorado? Uh, maybe it's that as well, where Trout plays in L.A., but L.A.'s not relevant. See, for me, I could see these guys that have had injury problems in recent memory, like Harper, like Kershaw not playing, and also because their teams are highly relevant. Their teams might win it all this year. The Dodgers, they're training for that. The Nationals are going for that as well. The Halos, Trout's been healthy. And the Halos really aren't going for a World Series title. They're not in that state. Trout probably realizes that, too, in the back of his head. Even though it's hard to admit it right now in spring ball, nobody wants to in that Angels organization. So for me, if i got to be upset and have a beef with one of those three guys, it's going to be Mike Trout right now. But then, do baseball players even care about marketing? And a guy like that, does he care about it when he already has all of it? Because he's right. recognized he's world-renowned as the best player in Major League Baseball. The thing is, though, worldwide, these players aren't marketed the best. Major League Baseball doesn't truly have big faces of the game that are recognized overseas on the international stage. This is a way to get recognized overseas, right? Because the World Baseball Classic is taking place on that international stage. So if Trout really wanted to get recognized, or is it Dom also, and Doc can get in here, the psychologist, our resident psychologist on Tiger's Talk, can let us know as well about, is it just not a big deal to baseball players, you think, uh, to get that attention worldwide, such as for Mike Trout? You know, Vito, it's a good question. It's one of those things where you can't knock a guy for not wanting to do it because, like you said, and like the question that I posed earlier in that they also have to worry about their brand. Now, I know it's not nice to say, and many people don't want to conceptualize it like that. Many people will say, hey, if your country comes calling, you drop everything. But you got to realize that when you're talking in a neighborhood of 26 to $30 million a year and the potential that you could earn in your lifetime, you can't risk it. And sometimes these guys don't want to go down there and play for the country. And I understand it. I'm more of a guy that would probably go do it once, but that's probably it. And so I don't knock a guy for not doing it, but there may be other factors as well. Maybe he's rehabbing a minor injury that nobody knows about, or maybe he wants to get in some more reps for his own performance. You can't knock a guy for not wanting to play. You just honor those that do, that have signed up to play for Team America. Honor those guys, and those that aren't there, they're not there. So it's just one of those things where when you're talking about big money sports, it's a debate that you have to have, a discussion that you have to have regarding which talent you're letting go to go down there and what is the cost benefit of playing in the World Baseball Classic. That's why I asked you guys, what is this all about? Why is this? I know I understand competition. I understand worldwide type stuff, but I'm more of a guy that likes to see real competition. So I would rather see like the World Series winner, the Cubs, take on a team of like, you know, take on the Venezuelans, take on the Costa Ricans. That'd be cool. Just, yeah. you know, and round robin or just do a quick tour around different countries like uh-huh. soccer teams do, you know? Yep. Like, you know how in English soccer you get Manchester United to come over here and play a series of all-star games? Maybe the Cubs can go over to, you know, the Dominican Republic and play five or six games, boost up some um, interest there and let them play some games. But tournaments and stuff like that, I understand World Baseball Classic, who's the best team, pride and stuff like that. But I also understand those that also want to focus on the upcoming season ahead. And focusing on the money that they're making. You know, it's a risk. And you're the money man, the businessman. You brought up that point of view, too, where he doesn't want to risk an injury over in the World Baseball Classic when really it's not that grand of a thing to win it all. And Team USA, are they really going to win it all? Maybe he views that, too. But if he goes and plays on the team, but the thing is we can't really get mad at him or, you know, shame him for not playing and say, oh, he doesn't have passion for his country, right, or pride in his country. That's why I don't like either, Dom. Wouldn't it be a shame for people to go out and criticize Mike Trout for not playing and then labeling him as somebody that doesn't have pride in his country because oh, he's not playing for Team USA? And, you know, some people are taking the hot take and taking that stance right now about Trout, about Harper, about Kershaw, and that's not right. It's more about, I think, what Doc said, protecting his brand and the money they're bound to make with their big league ball club. I mean, and that's their job. That's what they have to go out and, you know, work for. So he's not working for Team USA. That 
you know, that's not his his real job. So down. Yeah. And uh, added to that, a lot of this, you know, you were mentioning about getting you know, having these star players in the United States maybe market themselves in the in the rest of the world. You know, but it's interesting. You see, you know, you watch the game. You watch the game in the Tokyo Dome, and to be honest with you, I don't think you know the p- people based on. You know, what I see, the culture is so polarized in, in Asia, in even Cuba, you know, in Dominican Republic. You know, they, had, they chant their name. They have these names they chant. Even no one you've ever heard of before. It's not about, in, in, in baseball, you know, Japan, they had Sadahara O. Oh, they had great players go up and down, you know, through the Japanese league, through Japan. And they really cherish their own. Um, it's not like where, you know, in, the, in basketball... America's seen as maybe like a beacon. You know, you have Kobe Bryant. You know, going into going to Japan. Everyone in China loves the Chinese. Love, love Kobe. Kobe Bryant. Love LeBron James. They loved Kobe when he was playing. He was their star, the guy that they really focused their attention on. See, in baseball, Ichiro Suzuki in Japan, they don't is, have that. Trout. I don't think they care about here, him. Is up here. He is, but like Trout, these American right. players, Kershaw, yep, exactly. Harper, they They're don't not, care about no. those guys over there. They have their so guys. Should Major League Baseball rob man for they the have commissioner? Their roots. Should the commissioner though push these guys to play because of that to grow the brand of baseball no, overseas? Or it's not that important. It doesn't matter, Dom. No, as you, as you guys were no. talking, I was just thinking that, you know, and sorry for my ignorance, but I would even think that maybe you make the World Baseball Classic, you redo it, and don't include professionals. Let the college athletes go, and let's see who the best youngsters are. Because, you know, Vito, there are competitions. Maybe you can create after the season or things like that, but maybe you could just scale it back and make it a competition of maybe under 25 players if you want to have some major league athletes or under 22 or whatever it is and make it a tournament where you can also have some amateurs in there as well, some college athletes, and really see, you know, and really make it a, a fun competition. But for professional athletes, yeah, I guess it's a competition that right now I don't think I want to see in March. I maybe want to see this every four years, maybe as a break, like an extended all star break for a couple weeks or, or so. Okay, yeah, so maybe. instead of the All Star game, maybe they should do that. That there might be something to that. It is already every four years in spring training interferes with that. But and at least it is every four years. But maybe they do it every four years in the middle of the season at and, the All Star break instead you, of the All Star game. Down and there are ba- baseball championships, you know, in Latin America where you know players play in the winter. Um, you'll have you know a, t- a Dominican Republic and Costa Rica, Puerto Rico. They'll all play each other, you know, for the Latin American Cup. You know, and guys will play going in winter, in spring. They'll play for their teams then, even major league players. You know, a lot of it, I think, is, I don't know if, like, they want to go back to where, you know, what's like in the Olympics, where you had guys, you didn't really, you didn't have major league baseball players. You didn't, and Doc mentioned, you know, you had these youngsters, up-and-coming guys, that maybe also wouldn't even make the big leagues. Never did make the big leagues. Yes. yes. So you didn't get those star players, and maybe the World Baseball Classic reverts to, you know, goes to that. Not, it doesn't revert to it, but goes to that because they want to save these guys' legs and keep them fresh for the start of the major league regular season. So but you know, there you is al- something to you that, also too. Hear, you also hear players, they like, you know, having a pl- having playing all year round. Just to get back, you know, you know, get, you know, get like a lather ready, you know, for spring training. You know, they'll go, they'll play winter ball, they'll play spring ball, you know, for their countries. You know, I think it's a lot of it has to do with culture, and um, the United States is never going to be a, you know, a beacon for as a global as sport. A global it's not going to be that like the NBA. See, no, I don't see. And it. Howard Bryant of ESPN.com just penned a column for ESPN.com, about this very issue with baseball players not really being faces of the world, you know, on a worldwide level. They're not really known where NBA guys are, NFL guys are, and the like. That's why I said, you know, Japan has their Babe Ruth in Sadahara O. They have their Willie Mays and Ichiro Suzuki, um, guys that have been there before. Ichiro was a Hall of Famer in Japan before he became... Uh, later in his career, he went to. It was more of a thing for you know when he first came to Seattle. This is a good point. He was more of a. It was a more of a thing for J- Japanese people um, when he came to Seattle. I mean, the Japanese media came in. They stormed in his rookie season for the Mariners. The United States was obviously they welcomed it and everything. But you see more of it where Japan and other countries um, really take that um, take the torch when it comes to their own players. so I guess it will, because you know what? They're going to push for their players to be successful Yes, at the biggest level, at, on the biggest stage, which is Major League Baseball, where players going overseas from the U.S., they're not feeling the same way, and no. we're not going to push them overseas, because I guess and Major League Baseball feels this way. They feel they don't need to do that, So and they really haven't, and those players, 
the best of baseball, these guys that are in their mid-20s, you know what? They're just not marketed over there because I guess it's more important about making sure they're known over you, in the now, States. Could you imagine? So, and that's why they'll never be faces of the quick. game, I guess, like those NBA players that we noted. So this would be – so Ichiro went from Japan to the United States. Now, could you imagine Mike Trout doing that and going to Japan? How much different that would be? It wouldn't make sense to these guys. And the money right. is in Major League Baseball. Right. You make – your biggest money is going to be in Major League Baseball. And I guess they don't feel like they're going to make their money over there in Major League Baseball because they're not going to ever have a team like in Mexico City or in Cuba or in Japan. So I guess it's not worth it to them to market their sport over there. But it does diminish these guys, though, overseas, too, at the same time. They're not as well-known worldwide like the NBA's best players, like the NFL's yes. best players, Tom Brady, Peyton Manning. Kobe. But we can go on about this yep. all day long. And we already have long enough. And I, I can tell that, Doc and Dom, you feel that way yourself. Now, two faces of baseball, kind of, not on the same level as Trout, Harper, and Kershaw, but guys that have played for the Tigers or are currently playing for the Tigers. And there's this topic about them I wanted to go into, and it is regarding who are the Tigers. Now, looking at this a year after the fact, it is a topic of Ioannis Cespedes, who the Tigers did have at one point, and Justin Upton, who they do have now. And they had the chance last offseason to sign one of the two, and they chose Upton over Resigning Cespedes, who was traded, remember the Mets. Tigers got Michael Fulmer for him at the deadline. Cespedes, there was talk that he might rejoin the Tigers. Tigers didn't look like heavily pursued him. They got Justin Upton to play left field instead. Upton produced two wins above replacement. Cespedes, closer to three, like 2.9 according to BaseballReference.com. So Cespedes had the better 2016 campaign. He opted out and then got a four-year deal this past offseason. Now looking back at that, who... Do you think the Tigers would have been better off with now? Looking at also the contracts these guys have. And we know that what Cespedes is being paid right now is a lot of money. It's $22.5 million this season. And then at least $29 mil the following three campaigns. Where right now, you know, Upton got six years at $22.125 million annually with the opt-out clause after this season. So less money as of right now for Upton than what the Mets are paying Cespedes. It's a new deal. But still, who would you say the Tigers would have been better off when taking that into account the contracts for these two guys too down? They would be better off with Ioannis Cespedes. And a lot of this has to do with, you know, Cespedes made that made an adjustment somewhere. You know, he struck out uh, when he in his, his season again with uh, Oakland. You know, he struck out 141 times, actually, in 2015. Then he struck out 87 times with, well, he struck out 87 times with the Tigers 54 times with the Mets. But a lot of the, it, it, you look at his, you know, his strikeout rate, and he's not, he didn't strike out as much this past season. Uh, he gets on base better. And maybe the most confounding thing the Tigers have had to deal with is center field. Ioannis Cespedes was always more flexible defensively. Where are you going to put him? Where are you going to position him? Where they might not have had the luxury to sign uh, or might might not have had the opportunity to sign other guys like Maben had they you know stuck to Cespedes or let's say Cespedes was there we don't know what you know what the contract status was if he wanted to you know explore New York and whatnot but you know if you're asking me you know where would the Tigers be you know better off right now when we saw what you know Upton did in the first half but Upton's never going to be you know Cespedes can hit 300 he just he showed it um, you know, he can hit around 280 to 300. He gets on base. He's a better average hitter. Now, better OBP really Upton has been until recently, perhaps. Recently, yeah. Cespedes, his average has really experienced a an uptick. Like, yes. Cespedes has gotten better at hitting He's for average. more seasoned. And yeah. guys, to look at the stat here from uh, their career and in 2016, um, Justin Upton has a career war of 26.7 versus 18.7 war for Ioannis Cespedes. But when you look at it last year, in 2016, Justin Upton batted 570 times with 31 home runs and 81 uh, runs and 87 runs batted in. Ioannis Cespedes only batted 479 times with 31 home runs, mm-hmm. 72 runs, and 86 RBIs. One, almost 100 fewer at-bats with that production. And you, you get a sense that for the money, though, you know, overall, yes, Ioannis Cespedes, we can clearly state factually, is a better player. But for the money, in terms of what you're getting, if Justin Upton can recreate that throughout the course of an entire season, then I think you got a guy in Justin Upton whose value is worth his contract. 
I think towards the end of Yuanis Cespedes' deal, you probably might be looking at overpaying it for a guy at that age. So Justin Upton's contract is okay at this point in time. And I think what makes it also attractive is that buyout. He has an option that if he has a great year, it's an incentive for him to play really well. And then he can just opt out in terms of the clause that he can enact in his deal and say, hey, I want to opt out. I want to go test free agency. And if he wants big time money, then he can go out and shop himself and, and go elsewhere. But I think, you know, people look at the opt out clause as a negative and sometimes it can be a positive in that it's going to motivate him to perform. I mean, 30 home, 31 home runs his first year with the Tigers, and it just was kind of marred by the struggles that he had in the first half. But I think that a guy like Justin Upton, if he can play well all the way through this year, I think that you got a guy with the contract that he has, you got a guy that I think is worth it right now in terms of where he's at with the Tigers. Well, I think also what people have said when the Tigers signed Upton is that, remember, it's really only a two-year deal, and then they can do whatever they want with him. When he, if he opts out, they don't have to re-sign him. So really they're getting... Two years of his prime, his prime years, too, where Cespedes is already 31, Upton's only 29. Too. So remember that, too. And Upton's been more durable. And I don't think people take that into account but, about Justin but, but Upton, the flip too. But si- the flip side is he doesn't have to. He doesn't have to opt out. He can just have a... He can t- take he, the money, can, I know, He which can sucks. take the money, which yeah. sucks. But if he realizes if he has 40, 45 home runs this year, he can make six, seven more million dollars a year. Oh, yeah, cash in, baby. And I hope he would because then the Tigers don't have to resign him because then yeah. they can view him as a candidate to resign or a guy they just let go if they want to get under that salary, uh, that luxury tax threshold, which so is my, what they're entertaining it looks like too right now. So my vote is Justin Upton, good, a good acquisition. Let's see what he can do in 2017. Probably won't be the biggest issue we're talking about because uh, um, before we end this, Brad Ausmus, people are reporting, he just said, listen, if we keep pitching this awfully <laughs> in spring training, then the roster decisions will be easy for me. They just won't be on the team. Or that he's going to quit. Quit. So keep pitching awfully, and then he will quit. And then we get Jim Leland back as manager. That's my hope, at least. It's not going to happen, though. Dom, projected stats now for Upton, according to Baseball Prospectus right now, it has him at 25 home runs, 73 ribbies for 2017. Do you like those numbers? Uh, and I guess I'm asking you right now, Big Vito's over-under. Let's play a game of that very popular game nationwide, Dom. You know about Big Vito's over-under. And over-under, 25 home runs, and then also 73 runs batted in in 2017 out of J-Up. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take 25. I'll, I'll take, I'm going to say he hits 26, but I think he's going to be under on the RBI mark. Okay, very good. I'm going to take, well, I can't just say 25. I'm going to take actually the over in both. I think he surprises you in many and has a better first right. half. If he does, the thing is, Diamond Doc, I think we can all agree upon here. If he has a better first half, his numbers could be astronomically oh, right, right, yeah. good and higher yeah. than last year is what I'm getting at mostly, too. But, Dom- you know, he's he's the product of his lineup. So the good thing about the Tigers is that you have J.D. and Miggy in that lineup. So what happens in Casty, you know, if Casty... Casty, I like that. If Casty hits as well, V-Mart hits, this will help Upton. They, they were a game away from making the playoffs, and we remember you know, Upton had a torrid, torrid second half last year. Um, I'm pretty sure he, was, he had his career high in homers. So it's funny because he did nothing in the first half and he had one of the best second halves in all of baseball. And people don't take that into account. He had the toward rate with the home run production, but people don't realize that really he was one of the best hitters in all of baseball, not just for the Tigers. No, he was a best. he really helped carry the Tigers lineup too down the stretch. Yeah, he and he's a reason why as bad as they were in the first half, he's a reason why they were so close to getting in to the playoffs. And really, I think we can all agree upon this too, is that the Tigers would have made it in if JD Martinez didn't get hurt. And if Casty, your boy, I guess Casty, if he didn't get hurt too. Right, right. They may have, might have gotten in there, and you know, back to the Cespedes and Upton, real quick. Um, really quick. I'm yes. Just, a lot. You're going to take the guy with the higher average, typically. So even though it doesn't matter. So if you're taking, you know, if you're asking me, who am I going to start? You know, in in the outfield between those two, and if I was, if it was a new team, you're going to take the guy with the higher average, and you're going to take Cespedes. Now negotiations first started. You know, with Oakland, you know, Cespedes wasn't hit. He was hitting in the 220s. Um, he had a year, he, he barely even got, you know, over 250 uh, average-wise. But now you're seeing a Cespedes that has seasoned well, um, got acclimated to the majors, and that's where, you know, the two break off, in my opinion. And that's why I would have kept on, I would have kept Cespedes, to done everything possible with any money. To keep your boy to keep, Cespi. To keep Cespi. Not Cassie, but Cespi. He's sexy too, Cespi. And can play center field a lot more than Justin Upton, which is what they need right now. And they probably wouldn't have gone out and, and got to too. Yeah, last and year. You, so. circum- yeah. When we do that, I think we realize that, Dom. And we realize that you're insightful, you're smart, and you're sexy. And Doc, you're kind of sexy, but you're totally smart because you're a psychologist. And I'm hoping that I'm smart and sexy as well. Guys, with that, that has been episode number 81 of 
Tiger's Talk. Thanks for tuning in. And next week, please tune in once again. And until then, have a great week. Goodbye, guys.